further ado, thank you for coming. Um, and I'm Gash Parajman, and I'll be talking about points of order, as in the points in an order. Um, so today, we're going to look at how order works in mathematics. Uh, I imagine quite a lot of you will know this already, but I did a quick recap of everything. Like, I basically start with Homer, so don't be afraid. Um, we're going to look at how C++ models this and how C++ supports you in getting it right. We will not talk so much about how it supports you in getting it wrong. Um, <laughs> we tried very hard not to do that. Um, all right, so first I, I want to thank uh, not a few people. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Barry. Uh, because he is a machine for writing papers. I, I have no idea when he finds the time. I am convinced he has a uh, time turner. Uh, but he wrote like five papers about this and got most of them accepted. And I like helped a little. Um, so uh, Jeff Snyder, um, he is also one of my co-authors. Um, he made me understand many things. Uh, let's just put it that way. Brilliant mind. Uh, and Lawrence Krell for starting P100 all those years ago with like the view to fixing float and getting the correct orderings for float from the IEEE standard or the IEC 559, whatever you want to call it, into the language. Of course, we can't fix float, okay? Like float is float, but at least we can give you facilities to unbreak it yourself if you want to. We'll talk about that. Um, there are more collaborators that are not co-authors. Um, first of all, Herb Sutter, Jens, and Walter Brown, they, they wrote the seminal paper that like, laid the framework that we then completely changed. But without their vision, there would be no spaceship. Um, and they also spoke, to, like, devoted a lot of time to talking to us, which was really nice of them. Um, Tony and Lisa, um, Tony's not here, but Lisa is. Um, thank you for talking to us about ordering because you have recall for this stuff that is just incredible. Uh, and for Tony to have the conviction of calling things bullshit a lot. Uh, <laughs> and the problem is he's right when he does that. So, you know, um, and uh, Arthur for effectively doing the same thing. Thank you very much. Um, Augustine, Tim Song, Richard Smith, they did an enormous amount of like just helping with papers. Like with, without their help, wording would not be wording. It would be something else that we can't call that. Um, and uh, of course, David Stone for his like just incredible breadth of research into the library and where exactly we need spaceship and where we don't. And like that, I, I have no idea. I, I could never do that. He's amazing. All right. And uh, I would also like to thank my wife because this took an inordinate amount of time and evenings and uh, she like brought me ramen, and that was really nice. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Zoe. Um, so let's let's talk about order. Let, but before we talk about order, we need to like get something out of the way, and that's actually the hard part. We need to talk about equality and equivalence, because unless we get this out of the way, everything is a mess, as evidenced by many committee meetings. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so let's start with what is equality and then we'll figure out what equivalence is. So equality in mathematics is like a perfectly clear notion. You have a set, elements of the set are distinct because that's how sets are defined and they're always equal to themselves. That's equality, done, end of story. Okay? <laughs> of course then the we've effectively just moved the mess somewhere else, right? Like, if, if anything is this clear, you, you know there's something. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, fortunately, we've got elements of programming that sorts out this mess, sort of, or rather just moves it somewhere else slightly better. Um, so this is a graph of the equality relation. Every element is in relation with itself. Sorry, I, I got to do this. Um, and it is in relation with nothing else as far as equality is concerned. Um, so this is its graph. That's equality. Crucially, nothing else is equality. 
Very many things can look like equality if you squint at them, and that's really useful, but nothing else is equality. All right. So, equivalence. Yes? Does that translate directly? I want to do a story, but does it translate directly to C++, where this will be single object and only for that equality matters? We'll talk about that. <laughs> it, it's more complicated, and I actually have a story, and I'll get there. All right, but thanks for the question. It's a great question. Um, it's the right question. Uh, so equivalence is when you have a set, A, B, C, D, and they're in like this special interconnected relationship, right? Like we, we see that they sort of fall apart it, it, down the middle and within every part, um, things are completely connected also to themselves. So let's call this relation squiggle because it sorts of lo sort of looks like equality, but it's not actually equality. Um, and we say that A is squiggled to B and C is squiggled to D. Um, and this gives rise to equivalence classes. Um, what we saw was an equivalence relation. It's you know, transitive and reflexive and symmetric, and that's enough. Uh, and equivalence classes E and F are also sets. They're subsets of the product, uh, sorry, of the potential set of the original set. Too many sets, that's why nobody likes mathematics. Um, but equivalence classes are really nice because equivalence, so okay, I, I also want to introduce some nomenclature. Um, equivalence relations induce equivalence classes over sets. And uh, that's really important because then we can do a quotient set. So we have a, the original set S that contained A, B, C, and D. And we partitioned this set into equivalence classes using squiggle. And now we say, well, what we really want to be looking at is actually this set of equivalence classes and not the original set. But this set of equivalence classes is in our heads, right? It's not like a real thing we can touch. Like if we had, you know, apples in that set and those apples were all different because they had different colors, let's say, just to be pedantic, pedantic for Lisa. Uh, <laughs> um, then we can put the yellow ones here and the red ones here. And like we, we, we don't have like a group of red apples. A group of re red apples is a figment of our imagination, right? But really what we want to say is we've got two groups. Um, and we don't care about what's in that group. But we now have basically made a new e equality on this set of equivalence classes. So that's the point, right? Whenever you have an equivalence relation, you can partition the set and then you can do a quotient over it and then you've got an equality over the set of equivalence classes, which are fictitious if you're actually doing programming. So you actually want to do something really cool. And this is where we get kind of back to programming. We can really test equality or inequality of two fictitious uh, equivalence classes by having two exemplars and just comparing those using squiggle. And if we get, you know, they're equal, then we know they belong to the same equivalence class and we know that these two things that are represented by these two exemplars are actually the same thing. If we get not squiggle, then there's two different equivalence classes. And that's really powerful. This is how we reason about string, for instance, and vector, because we do a quotient over capacity. Because it doesn't matter, right? Um, so that's, that's basically it, right? Like I've got some math here, um, but that's really the, the cool thing, right? Like we can see whether two um, equivalence classes are equal by testing any of the exemplars using the original squiggle relation. And so this is what we say that the squiggle in induces an equality over the set of equivalence classes. All right, so this is the punchline that I said like four times already. Um, we are sometimes inexact and say, Squiggle is an equality on the set of equivalence classes. 
Like, that's not completely true. Like, it actually induces an equality relation over the quotient set, but who wants to say that? Right? So we say, like, just, okay, it's an equality if that's all we care about. So, it, but it's really important to keep in mind that when we say equality, we can actually mean these two different things, right? One, one of them is like the really hard equality that is equality, and the other is equality over some quotient set that is induced by this equivalence relation and so on. These two things are very different. They're so different that it's usually obvious which one we mean. Not to everyone on the committee. <laughs> All right, um, I said this is really cheap for testing and the cool thing is that we can get away from uh, testing equalities of our sets in you know, O of n squared because we need to say like this is subset, this is subset. Um, no, we can just test two things if we know that it's an equality relation, right? It lets us speed things up. And this is so obvious we already do it. Like I didn't need to teach you this. Like, I'm, I'm teaching you the math behind what you already know. Um, all right. So now we come to the C++ portion, and we're going to alternate a few more times. Um, how does this relate to C++? Well, from elements of programming, thank you, Alex, um, a value type is a correspondence between a species and a datum. All right, now we need to define two terms. <laughs> um, a datum is a finite sequence of ones and zeros. Uh, he sort of hand waves the, the far parts of objects if you've read elements of programming. It all works out in the end, but let it be a finite sequence of ones and zeros possibly interspersed by things that don't matter. Um, and a species is more like a platonic thing, and I know Lisa doesn't like that, but that's okay because we're not dealing with platonic things. We're dealing with very concrete things based on our problem domain. Now, I can't tell you what your problem domain is, but you sure as hell know, or you better. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so a species describes a set of common properties of essentially equivalent entities. And this is the real rub of the issue of sweeping things under the rug. Essentially, equivalent entities. This is what you as a programmer needs to decide on how this maps to your domain. And this is all in your head. This, you know, uh, correspondence is in mapping from and to. This is not the function you can write. Computers don't deal with your head. A type is half in your head and half in the computer. And what this um, essentially equivalent means, that's how you write operator equals. Equality and type are inextricably linked. Equality effectively defines your type. Okay? A type is how we map, map datums to entities and what an entity is and what it like, isn't, like how it's separated in terms of topology or, you know, a door uh, from, an, uh, from another entity is exactly what your operator equals defines it, it, and, and models, right? Like, this is what you need to decide as a programmer what to give your type. And it influences the name of that type. And we're going to see that later. Um, but this equivalence that's in our head induces the equality on the datums, on the type. Do you see how I link that? Like we, we have this math in our head and like there's a lot of molecules in this room and some of them clump together slightly better and we put an equivalence relation on it and say that's Mickey. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and then we put another equivalence relation over it and say that, you know, anyone who is at CppCon is in one equivalence class and anyone who's, you know, not is in another equivalence class and that's how we divide these things. So we can, we can model the world in a finite number of things this way. Otherwise, we'd have real problems. Yes? Is there a correspondence between the datums and 
the species and what you mentioned earlier, the elements of the set and the elements of the um, equivalence class there? Okay, let me try and repeat this. Is there a correspondence between the datum and the sets and the equivalence classes? Yeah, what I'm trying to understand is whether there's a direct mapping between the math stuff you said earlier and the C++ stuff you talked about. Yes, okay. So that's what I was trying to elucidate, but I guess I didn't do a good enough job. So let's try again. All right. A type is this correspondence. So half of the type lives in your head, half of it lives in the computer. The equivalence that we said here, right, this, this essentially equivalent entities, the entities live in the real world. This is what you're modeling, right? So this is the abstract sets that we had. And then we put an equivalent re equivalence relation still in our heads over these entities so that we can quantize them into something that makes sense. And then we write our equ equals equals operator which formalizes this notion and is an actual equality on our type. All right? So this is what, why I introduced the inducing of equality from an equivalence. That's really important because here we didn't only like switch sets, we actually completely switched domains. One's like from the real world to computer. Yes? Um, the, the answer is yes. You have created an equality out of the equivalence that is in your head once you defined operator equals. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Th this is how we fix this if we are trying to explain these, this to people. So, let's have an example, right? Because everybody loves examples and they make things clearer, hopefully. So let's, let's take a species to be a subset of, you know, the whole numbers. Whole numbers are in our head, like they don't actually exist, there's way too many of them to fit into the universe. Um, but there's a useful subset of Z that we can encode within 32. So that, that's sort of like our correspondence. Um, and that's our datum, it's 32 consecutive bits. And the induced equality is bitwise comparison. This one was like super easy, right? Um, what we completely didn't deal with, thank you hardware people, is that the ones and zeros are, you know, not actually a completely flat voltage and like all that stuff. We don't have to deal with that. We have an idealized representation in the computer. And so our equivalences over like you, all of these uh, fuzzy things end up being actually quite sharp. And that's really nice, right? Um, so we already have equivalence relations drawn for us. Yes, David. Is it equivalence because it's a subset of, of the integers? If it was just the integers, the quality would be quality equal to integers. Is that right? Um, so here I was being super pedantic, um, and you spotted it. So thank you. Uh, I did actually mean the 32-bit subset of Z. So in this case, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, which is also an equivalence, but it need not be an equality, right? Like it, every quality is an equivalence relation that might induce in itself, and that's fine. Um, so here I, I, I wanted to put the terms where they're supposed to be, but yes, it's exactly like that. All right, um, this one's everybody's favorite bugbear, and we're going to see it several times because it's, it's such a nice, clear example that everybody asks if you don't put it up. Um, so let's take nil-terminated case-insensitive string that's encoded in ASCII, okay? Because I, I don't want to deal with Unicode because it's too complicated and we don't have time for a Unicode talk. Um, so, you know, like basically char star, okay? Um, our equivalence, so sorry, the species is strings of abstract ASCII character and they always end in zero. So Ben was telling us about this before. That's basically his uh, free uh, monoid on strings. Um, and 
our equivalence is going to be case insensitive comparison. And a datum is an arbitrary long sequence of bytes. Um, and the induced equality is stir i CMP equals zero. And this is an actual equality because we said we didn't care about case. It's not an equivalence. Like th this is this is our mapping from you know abstract stuff to what we actually need to model. So trying to pretend that there's like some alternative universe where we can tell these things apart, like. No. If you named it cases sensitive string, don't lie. <laughs> yes? The, um, so if you were writing a, this in a class, right, this would imply that your copy constructor could just make all the, all the characters rotate. Exactly. You, you would be totally fine uh, normalizing case in your con copy constructor. And because your type literally can't tell the difference. All right, um, another example, stud string. Species is strings of abstract characters. Uh, it doesn't have an encoding. Um, the equivalence is character by character comparison. We don't care about nil bytes either. Um, we have a length, so it's an arbitrarily long sequence of bytes. Um, and the induced equality is the string equality. Like, this is obvious, I put it up because it's obvious, you're not missing anything. All right, uh, but we do ignore capacity. That's the cool bit about this, right? We ignore capacity because string is a value type. Uh, and so we're actually taking some of these datums and we're putting an equivalence relation over them. We're saying oh, capacity doesn't matter. And so that's why I said in the very beginning, strings are modulo capacity, right? And, and they can't tell themselves apart. And that's great. But you have to understand what they're actually modeling. Yes? Um, um, my question is that um, you're giving very high value to the operator equals equals. You're saying if two classes say they're equals instead of because of operator equals equals, that's it, that's the bottom line. And I, I can understand how that would be useful for this lecture. It doesn't have to be uh, true in practice. Like, okay. you could use operator equals equals as a tool. Sure, you could, but don't. Okay. Like, th th this, is, this is a talk where I'm trying to convince you not to do weird things, okay? So if you do weird things, then you'll, p you'll pay for them. Right? And you'll pay for them with either bugs because people aren't aware, um, or you'll pay for them in you know, the, the price of teaching people of how your code base works. Like, don't do that. And this is even worse now with Spaceship because we've made a bunch of rewrite rules that actually assume that these things do what they say. So like, d don't, like if you used to write, um, you know, uh, Operator overloads that did something fancy because you're doing DSLs, like just leave equals equals and not equals out of it. Because things will break completely and all the time. One, one example that I have in my head is uh, iterators versus sentinels. They, they have usually a very weird operator equals equals. Iterators over sentinels have a very weird operator equals equals, and that's correct because the sentinel is actually an the end thunk of an at end operation, and that's just a syntactic thing that doesn't actually mean equals. I yes, agree. Arthur. Arthur. I'm curious what you're going to get into later. Basically, that question about sentinel and iterator is asking about heterogeneous equality. If the two types are not the same, what does equal equal? I will tell you what the language does, and I will completely refrain from commenting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, it's useful in very particular situations, like that exact expression inside a for loop. Yeah. And if you take it anywhere out of that context, yeah. that's a foot gun. Don't I, do that. I've, I've written such iterators. Yeah. So the, the most succinct way I've heard this stated, stated is <clears throat> there's no technical reason that you can't make then equals mean equality and equals mean inequality except for correctness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. That is a very good point. 
they will now even rewrite into each other. <laughs> Foot guns more for your convenience if you already set one up. We will just fire it for you. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so here's another example. Some possible equivalences over set string. Um, and that's a, a, a question for you guys, right? Like, so an equality is an equivalence. It's not a particularly interesting one if you're asking about like equivalences, but it's the most useful one. That's why it's the equality. Um, so stir CMP is also an equality over strings. Uh, can someone tell me if these two are equal? No. That's true. They stop. They stop at embedded nils. That's correct. I'm saying stud string. I'm not saying like basic, basic string of weird. Um, Stir ICMP is a proper in like equivalence. Sure. Um, you could just do, I, f I forget everything but size. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing in certain contexts. It becomes isomorphic to a positive integer class. <laughs> it has a different datum. Um, sorry, non-negative integer class. And I think that was your murmur, right? Uh, all right. Um, and then we've got one weird one that's like putting capacity back. And so the question here is, like, which one of these is finer than the other? And I'll get to the weirder bits. Okay. I'm surprised that you don't list, like, uh, cster equals cster. Or is it the same? Ah, okay. That's the same kind of thing as this one. Sure. Um, that, that, that goes back to Lisa's talk about properties you shouldn't observe. <laughs> yes, Arthur. Yeah, Come on, stop, stop, stop going ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur's too smart. All right, um, so um, I'm, I'm going to get to that. But I, thi I think nobody can object that this is actually an equivalence relation over something. Like it's clearly symmetric and transitive and so on, but Arthur's got a point. We'll get to this. I have slides. Um, <laughs> all right, so... Um, the, let's, let's do another two definitions of finer and coarser. Um, if omega and delta are equivalences over the same set, uh, then delta is finer than omega. If whatever delta deems equivalent, so does omega. Is it the other way around? It might be the other way around. That seems, okay. Yeah. I was very underslept when I wrote this. Um, but basically, you're, you're, you're saying um, that the equivalence classes, like basically it's sort of like increasing resolution, but leaving all of the lines you already have where, where they are. Like you can't, you can't overlap the lines that you have. Yes, David? So every equivalence is finer than itself? Yes, that is correct. I know, it's like a less than or equal operation on the lattice of, of yeah. Uh, it is not strictly finer, yes. Um, but yes, that is correct. And in fact, the, the equivalence is, like the, the equality over equivalences is, is defined as it is finer, finer than itself. Sorry, it, 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 yeah, sorry, X is finer than Y and the other way around too. And that, that's the equality over equivalences. Um, and equivalences form a lattice, and that's really nice, but we're not going to get to lattices because I have 58 minutes left. Um, so th like, this is a really useful notion. Like, intuitively, it's obvious. But the, the main point that you must not forget is that the lines you already have, you can't move. You can split equivalent sets into finer equivalent sets. You can't like com completely repartition the set. All right, so this is the exercise that we had before. 
Which one's finer than the other? Here, yeah. Um, so here's here's kind of the baseline, right? We've got the equality. Um, that one is in fact the finest relation over your set, and uh, that's what Arthur was referencing. Um, of course, yes, you, you guys said stir CMP ignores everything after the first nil byte. Uh, stir I CMP also ignores case, so it's strictly uh, coarser than stir CMP. Um, stir CMP in turn is strictly coarser than number one, and you can see how these are transitive. That's why we get a, a lattice, because we also have the minimum element. Um, and the thing that uh, doesn't distinguish anything is the max element, so you always have these nice things. Um, it's also a monoid. <laughs> um, so um, size is coarser than both uh, five and one, but it's independent of two and three because those have nothing to do with each other. Um, and this one, let's look at this one because it's weird. Um, it is not, I, that should have said equivalence. It's not an equivalence. I have proof. I'm going to need to read the proof from over here because I don't want to keep squinting back. All right, so it is not equals, and that's what equality is defined as. And it's not in tune with the species of stud string. And it's not even an equivalence over stud string, and that's, that's the fun part. So, proof by counterexample. First proof we do. We're going to do three, I hope. Um, so, the trick is we get to substitute equal elements in any equation. That's the trick. And so, we can say, for instance, let's check if it's symmetric over stud string. That's the important bit, right? Um, this is our, this is our, um, equality, right? Well, equivalence that we're trying to check. We've got two strings A and B and we say A reserve one, which, you know, makes capacity different. And then we say, well, from EQAA, EQAA follows. This is true. Um, but we get to substitute the last B because they're equal. And this is no longer true. So, we found a counterexample. This is, in fact, not an equivalence over stud string. Um, and another way to put this, stud string is a quotient space modulo capacity. And f of xy, as in the eq of xy, is not a function on this quotient space. It's a multifunction because the, the, this uh, you know, um, equivalence uh, class of empty strings, one of which has one capacity, actually maps with this function to two different things. So that's a multifunction, right? Because the, the, the whole equivalence set is our entity. We can't split it up if we're talking about stud string. Yes, Bryce? Uh, I'm not sure I understood your proof. All right. So in here, we get to substitute equal elements for equal elements. We can do that in any but equation always. But A and B are equal because we know stud No, they're equal because they're equal over equality on stud string. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the trick, right? Like it, it's all obvious if you have the right frame of mind. And th that, that's, the, that's what I'm trying to teach you, right? Like the thing is you need, to, when, when you're talking about equalities and equivalences, you need to know which context you're in. Because an equivalence in one context is an equality in another context. And if those two are not the same, you have problems. Or, I mean, if you don't distinguish between them, you have problems. So, like, we all know that this thing is transitive and symmetric in a computer. Right? But as uh, Zach, no? was you who said, uh, like, you can just copy a, a thing and normalize. You could do that in an equation, and that should be fine. That, like, equals should be preserving over copies, and it should be <laughs> preserving over equation and reasoning. That's kind of the point, and it's not. So that's why this, this proof works. Yes? Another interpretation of this proof could be that the equality operator that we define on C is not really an equality. 
So the whole point is that strings are this quotient type. They don't get to be something else. Yes, the, what, what, what the capacity is observable, but it's kind of like outside of the type. So like an address of a string is also observable, but you're not supposed to use it if you're doing equational reasoning. If you're, you know, std vector and like an allocator and you're doing fancy things behind the scenes, like that's fine, but you're not doing equational reasoning. Uh, yes. The thing is you could leave out the capacity and you would, uh, would get a perfect reasonable string also. True. Is that really true? So capacity, for instance, affects, you know, iterator validation rules and you can't make them strings, right? Which is a when you concatenate a thing to a string, you have changed its value. Um, it is true that like all of this stuff of operator invalidation, that's true, but equals doesn't observe that. True. Because equals doesn't compare in the middle of you concatenating, right? And that, that's also why this modulo makes sense. <laughs> Zach. I actually like his example, and his example can point to a real bug. If you have a vector of strings, and at some point at the beginning, you decide to reserve space in all those strings because you want to do something much later, you might not realize that at some point, your vector might copy all the strings again, and you completely lost that reserve yeah. that you did at the beginning, even though you thought it's exactly the same string. Yeah. But his definition of the string is this abstract thing. No, it's it's I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with both sides here. All right, yeah. yeah so I think, I think the point these right now to bring home is that if you go back to your point uh, about type is part in your head, right? What does it mean for string equality? And, you know, circle that back down to what we've just been saying. If the equivalence class that your equal equal operator induces doesn't actually match what's in your head, you're going to have problems. Exactly. Um, let, me re let me try to repeat this. If the equals operator, sorry, if the equivalence that's in your head does not induce the equals operator that you wrote, you're going to have problems. Uh, sorry, I really would love to like continue this discussion for like the end of the talk, but I've got like we haven't come to the ordering yet. <laughs> so, like this is fun, and I think we all got the gist at this point. Okay, um, all right, we we did this, um, and this proof also I hope convinced everybody that equality is the finest equivalence on the type. And the type here is the context. You could make a different type, but with the same datum that would have a different equality. And then all of every, that everything said, sorry, all of what everyone said is true, right? Like you could make a different type, but the type that you made is partly defined by, the, by its equality. And once you've defined its equality, that's the type that you made. Okay? All right. There is no such thing as weak equality. <laughs> Some people do not understand this. We do not have stud weak equality in the standard. <laughs> if you see it, it's a figment of your imagination and look away. <laughs> um, and, and, and if at this point you don't believe your own brain, ask Tony. Um, all right. We've basically been over this, so I'm just going to, oh yeah, these are the takeaways. So this is the recap. Equality encodes the species of the type. It encodes it in our, you know, it's part of it. Um, and there's all this talk about if x is equal to y, then f of x is equal to f of i substitutability. Like, yes, in mathematics, definitely true. That's really cool. Um, you guys just came up with a million of examples that breaks this and effectively what we're saying is that we have functions that are first class citizens and obey our type and we have functions that do not obey our type's equality. Uh, and look at addresses and capacity and that's fine. 
but that's where all of this only looks at salient details of the type and blah, blah, blah. No. If it has the same idea of equality, it's a good function. If it doesn't have the same idea of equality, it's plumbing. <laughs> yes, Ben. That is, yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, I think that's a really good example of when, of where the standard took this approach and said, on platforms that don't care about case, we're not going to care about case. So they encoded the correct idea of what a path is on that system into the equality operator, right? That means you can do equational reasoning and you'll be right. Oh, actually, there might be more than two paths in the plane. I forget that. Um, There's also like a file or something. Yes, I know something. Yes, and that's a mess. <laughs> uh, you, you get into aliasing and things, and that, that's where a file system path becomes more than a fancy string. Uh, that's when it becomes an actual kind of handle, yeah kind of handle. Um, and that's where it ceases to be a value type with a remote part that it controls, because it doesn't control it, right? Like it's, it's sort of like a, there might be something there, or it can shape, yeah. So I, I, I think that the value semantic part of path obeys these rules and it's fine. The non-value semantic part of path has nothing to do with this. Uh, because we have types that are mechanisms and we have types that are values and there are some that are sort of in between like path um, and Mechanisms fundamentally are about doing things uh, They don't represent things right and that that's the part of path that this talk does not talk about Right, okay, like we, we yes Okay um, that's all I wanted to say about this. Uh, this is where we come to the part of the spaceship paper that's about equality. Uh, we have the ability to let you default operator equals, and that's really nice because it'll do what you think it'll do. And there's more. Obviously, it'll compare bases. That's also nice. The point is, you will co forget to compare bases. It will not. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you need to write the equals default, otherwise we'd be breaking code. So, sorry, we, you know, like everybody knows we got the defaults wrong, but that's what they are. You have to write the equals default, unless something else, which I'll get to. Um, so, we will actually do rewrite rules on this operator equals. So, if you have two types that kind of, sort of, represent the same abstract species. Like stud string and string view in any given moment of time are trying to model the same species of this is a bunch of characters that you can compare. Like they have fundamentally different behavior when it comes to, you know, other parts of like being a reference type and stuff like that. But string view goes to great lengths to try and act like a value type whenever it can. Um, so if you have an equal, like a dot equals equals on string and you don't have one on string view and you write like string view equals equals string, then we'll see, oh, string view doesn't have this operator hypothetically. Uh, it does, but you know, hypothetically, if it didn't, um, we would say, but maybe string has it and we'll turn them around and do the lookup again. Uh, so that's how you can actually do a very significant amount of um, splitting translation units because types that depend on other types can offer interoperability be without like um, having like forward declarations that then are in that translation unit just so you can provide opposite operators. Right, so that's really nice. And th the cool thing about this is that you can finally start providing equality as a member 
because it'll work symmetrically both ways and won't participate in ADL, right? Which, which is really nice if, for people who hate ADL and it's nice because it's fast, yes? No. Yes. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> it's true. Like there, there's a, th there was a very long thread on the reflectors recently where um, someone pointed out that this breaks code and effectively three quarters of EWG came down and said, we don't care. Nobody writes this kind of code and if they did, they deserve it. It, it is a rare thing when this happens. Usually Vila is very conservative and so are a few other people. But in this case, the, the, like the counter example was so absurd. They were like, this is probably already a bug. If you get a compile error now, that's great. Um, so we will also do this rewrite. So yes? They form an overload set. So you actually look up one way and the other way and you actually do the whole overload set and then if you get an amb ambiguity, you will actually have an ambiguity. So it's completely symmetric and that's why it broke code. Um, but people should fix those in s uh, because they are very likely to be hiding bugs. Th that, yes? If string view has a comparison to string, if string has a comparison to string view, that's a uh, ambiguous overload. Is that what I understood? Uh, if you write it a really weird way, then yes, but otherwise you'll probably end up picking one. So I just want to point out that's true now, too. Yeah, that's also true. Uh, I mean, you can try to play that later with you, but I also want to hear about the <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we will rewrite this for you, too, so you don't have to provide not equals if you provide equals. Yes, this will break code. Yes, we don't care. Um, so the point is really that this is a rewrite rule. We're not like going to magically generate a not equals function for you. So the language will actually rewrite it and then call just one function. So you actually get a reduction in code size for this. Not a big one. Most equality operators aren't that enormous, but it's still nice. You get hotter code. Um, all right. There's no new types for equality in the library. This is a figment of your imagination. There aren't any. All right. Order. Arthur gets his wish. Thank you. Um, all right. I get my wish too. All right. So an order is an anti-reflexive, asymmetric, but still transitive relation. Um, and let's break this down because these are slightly less familiar terms than the previous equal equivalence relation terms. So we've got reflexivity and anti-reflexivity. We know the reflexivity. If every element is related to itself, it's reflexive. It needs to be true for every element, but we know this. Anti-reflexive is the exact opposite of that. It's not like not the first thing. It's like nobody can be related to itself. Nobody. And that's why it's red over there. The, sorry if you can't see from the back row. Um, elements of programming calls this strict. I think that's really op like opaque. It's anti, uh, it's anti reflexive. Uh, symmetry, we know symmetry. If it goes one way, it goes the other way. Asymmetry is the exact opposite, it never goes the other way. Because we're doing strict ordering. Yes? Um, can the ordering be weak or not? This implies that it can be weak. We're going to get to that. OK. This implies that it can be weak. Yes, orderings can be weak. Yes, Odin? So like uh, a, a, a man would be not. We'll get to that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So transitivity, we all know. But there's one thing that transitivity gives you that I really want to mention. It allows you to do global reasoning, because it allows you to do inductive reasoning. 
right? It allows you to skip steps. And that's why we really need transitivity. Like without transitivity, all this beautiful house of cards breaks down. Um, so, yes. So we've got partial orders. These two things, uh, mind you, this is a different kind of diagram than were on the previous slides because there we had like self loops and stuff like this. This we're doing ordering relations. Everything's transitive. We like omit the transitive closures of everything so that we get clarity. Um, so this is a partial order. It fits all of the things uh, and that's it. It doesn't fit anything else. It's also a lattice in this particular case. That's nice. Um, but this is the order of exactly direct acy uh, directed acyclic graphs. Um, and we're not going to talk a whole lot about them because we don't have time. Uh, linear or total orders are the weak and strong uh, that we'll get to. Uh, and they're special because they have an additional property. It, they obey the trichotomy law. Um, so an order is linear if and only if there exists an equivalence, squiggle, such that exactly one of the statements is true for any given pair of x and y. Either x is less than y, x is greater than y, or x is equivalent to y. There just needs to exist such a squiggle. For instance, if we take the previous graph, we can make equivalence classes over this graph in such a way that this is our squiggle and this is now linearly ordered, as in the quotient set is linearly ordered. The previous set is still not linearly ordered. Yes? The, uh, the linear order is part of exactly one of the three? Exactly one of the three. Okay, so I can't cheat by you can't cheat. Yes, Arthur? So what's an example of a nonlinear partial order? Where's the result of that? This one. There is a, yeah, but there isn't an equivalence relation that distinguishes between B and C. Yes, because that's, that we didn't do equivalence classes yet, right? B and C are unordered. Exactly. So, sorry, partial order modulo an equivalence. No, because a uh, partial order doesn't induce an equivalence, and I'll have a proof for you. Because okay. this, I, I spent three hours once, and then I totally found a counterexample, and then I was like, I was so stupid, and then that's why I have a proof on the slides, because it's not obvious, even though it's super obvious in retrospect. All right, um, so this is a partial order because it distinguishes between B and C. After equivalence classes, B and C are not distinguishable in the quotient space, right? That's why we get a linear or order. All right? Okay, good. So a strong order, so an order is strong if the equivalence is the equality on the set. Right? It's finer goes both ways, we're good. An order is weak if this need not be true. So every strong order is a weak order, um, but not the other way around, quite obviously. Um, so if you're, for instance, the sort, you're going to require weak order, but you're going to expect a strong order in the vast majority of cases. Um, so practice proof one. It's very short, I promise you. Um, let less than be a weak order over the set S. Prove that delta which is defined as neither x is less than y, neither y is less than x. That's the usual thing that, you know, sort does to, yeah. So basically we're trying to say squiggle applies, but that's what we're trying to say, okay? Um, we we want to prove that this is an equivalence. So the way you do this is you say, well, less than is a weak ordering. We got that given. So that means there is some equivalence relation squiggle on S such that it's exactly either X less than Y or Y less than X or X squiggle Y. There is such a relation. 
And we want to prove that delta is squiggle. And that's actually really simple, right? Basically, we've got this trichotomy law and um, we effectively do this, right? So we write the definition of, uh, we write the definition of the trichotomy law in a slightly weird way. We're basically saying either this is, either both of these are true exactly when this is true, which is the trichotomy law. And then we notice that, oh wait, this is exactly x delta y. And then we say, well, if we rewrite x delta y to definition, we get exactly this. So that's the same thing. It, it, it's like so short that it's like, wait, why, what did you do? No, like, yeah, that's the, it, it, it's like super obvious, right? Like, the, it, it, yeah, it's that obvious. Now, what I tried doing when I spent, you know, three hours trying to prove this was I tried to actually prove, uh, uh, tra uh, sorry, uh, the thing that lets you skip over. Thank you. <laughs> um, words, words are hard. Um, and that's really hard. Like you, you get into weird things because you, you can't just, okay, never mind. Ne you don't care about my turmoil. Okay, um, <laughs> practice proof number two. That's what Arthur was looking for. Um, let, uh, what are we gonna call this? Squiggly less. Squiggly less, thank you. <laughs> be a partial ordering over the set S. Prove that this need not be an equivalence relation. That's the fun part. This is what I said that a partial order does not induce equivalence sets. You can probably find some, but it, there's no induced ones. Like you have to actually find one. Um, let's call this expression delta again. The rub is like, so reflexivity, that's kind of obvious because you just substitute in yes. And then symmetry, like the expression is symmetric. What are we gonna do, right? Um, and transitivity like that, that we may be onto something in transitivity. And you, you, like the easiest way to prove this is to find a counterexample, right? So this is a partial order. We've got A and B that are actually related with squiggly less, and then B that is unrelated to any one of them. And then we say, well, this is true. A delta B, yeah. And B delta C, since neither Par, pair are squiggly less related. So the, the, the expression holds. But if delta were transitive, then it would follow A delta C because we've got A delta B and B delta C. So that's transitivity, right? But that's clearly not true because A is squiggly less than C. So we found a counterexample, right? Like, Partial orders do not introduce equal, uh, equivalences. You have to actually find them. Like we could, we could find an equivalence. Like we could say A and B because they're on the same level are equivalent and this levelization is actually what you try to do. Like that's the first thing you try to do is assign levels to things and then you can have something that induces an equivalence relation because you've got a key function, that being the level ID, and then that's your equivalence. But we don't have that, right? Uh, no, you need to find an, an additional equivalence relation that has effectively nothing to do with the, well, that is compatible with your partial order, but is not induced by the partial order because there's many such relations. Okay, I have 29 minutes left and we're like, yeah. All right, so I want to talk to you about nat natural orders because that's what spaceship is all about. There's a lot of other things that aren't about spaceship in the spaceship paper. Natural orders is what spaceship is about. All right, so every value type is defined through its equality. We were over this, let's just take it at face value for now. Um, I hope you believe me, so. Um, so we wanna say that the equality is the natural equivalence on this type. By analogy, some types have a natural order. Some, way fewer than equality. All value types should have an equality. Otherwise, they're a very strange value type because you don't have that encoding of the, of the correspondence. But not all types have a natural order. So 
the one thing that we have to make sure of is that the natural order on the type induces the same equivalence classes that equality does. Otherwise, it is definitely not a natural order. It is something else. It might be super useful, but it is something else. Um, this is why it's always a strong order, because of this requirement. So let me repeat this. Every natural order on the type is a strong order because its induced equivalence classes are exactly the same as the ones that are induced by equality. Examples. Points in a DAG have a natural partial order. But don't define spaceship for that, sorry. Spaceship is a three-way comparison, not a four-way comparison. <laughs> don't define spaceship as partial order. All good partial orders are named. Um, Natural numbers have a, na a natural order that follows from their inductive definition, right? Like, that's nice. Uh, the, the whole numbers follows from the natural numbers plus some reflection and stuff. But it's still a natural order. Yes, Arthur? <laughs> All right. Um, the rationals have an order that they inherit from Q, sort of, if you squint very hard. Uh, from the rationals, sorry. Uh, and complex numbers do not have a natural order. They've got a whole ton of orders you can put on them. None of them is a natural order. Quite a few of those orders are strong, but they're still not natural orders. Like there's no like obviously this is the one order for for complex numbers. No, no, no. Like that order is dumb. Because you can't compute it, that's number one, like that's not a natural order. It, you, have, you have the ordering. Yes, Ben? Why are you considering an the integer of the natural order with the two components magnitude and sign, but you're not considering the C natural order with the two components magnitude and algorithm? Because they're not ordered. Yeah, like that is an order on complex numbers, what you just said. Yeah. It's just not the natural one. Um, so takeaways from this section, every linear order, order has an associated equivalence relation and this equivalence is exactly that. We've proved this and it has to be linear. Yes, Ben? No, that's not, that's exactly not what I'm saying. It goes the other way around. A natural order will always do that, okay. but not every order that does that is natural. There are many orders that do that. Okay. So what, so if you're saying that, what's the use of the adjective natural? Yeah. Because it's the one holy one. <laughs> and if like, if your, if your set has the one holy one, it's obvious that it does. Arthur was first. Yeah, natural order is a property of the type, just like equality. There is the, the type is is related to the, the real world entities you're trying to model. Those entities have a natural meaning for what it what does it mean to be equal, and you're coding that up with operator equal equal. They also have a natural meaning for what it means to be ordered. If they do, maybe you said they don't have an order, but if they do, it, that's what operator spaceship means. Exactly, David. All right. Um, if natural order is something that you are saying, like in my mental model of the type, this is the natural order, then we are pre-selecting that and just labeling it as natural order. Exactly. Now, if someone says, in my mind, this is a natural order for complex, then it has a natural order. Well, then they're welcome to code up a type that does that. But I might look at that and say, complex is really the wrong word for that type because that's not what I, when 
I hear complex, I don't think of that. Have you considered calling it uh, money complex? Widget? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly true, right? Like if, if you put a, what you put as spaceship is how you're defining the natural order on the type. That, that's how you're encoding it, right? And some types don't have an obvious one, others do. And if you think that the, a, a different one should be the spaceship, you have a different type. Yes? So would you define natural order as whatever the standard family has decided is the natural order for the type? Uh, no. Uh, the natural order is very domain specific. Our types that we have are usually not. So we imagine what best thing would be a natural order for that type, and that's what it is, right? And if you think that we got it wrong, make a different type, redefine spaceship, you have your own type. It is part of the, sort of like the definition. It's, it's, it's not possible to like, um, divine a natural order from the C++ implementation. You divine the natural order from what the type is. Can you, can you then say that the standard defines a finite number of types, the standard itself only defines a finite number of types, and the standard has built three sets of only natural orders for each of these types? Yes, and that is exactly correct. Yes. It's all axiomatic. Yes, uh, Th this is axiomatic because this is how we define the types. Lisa. Uh, does that even apply when the standard defines an order which is not by your definition of natural order? Some of that is historical baggage and other people should, like, and, and some of it is the people have not seen the stock. <laughs> These things are hard. Like, uh, no, I, I think historical baggage counts here. Yeah, uh, okay, Arthur and then we're going forward. Or I wrote a copy constructor where copies aren't equal. Isn't this awesome? But people should tell you you're doing it wrong and you should stop. Exactly. Thank you, Arthur. Um, the, 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 uh, Arthur basically said, you can do weird things. We're not going to stop you. But we are going to assume that you aren't. And so our, your code will break if you try to use it with ours. Don't do that. All right. So that, that's about natural ordering. OK, so we, we went over all of this. If equivalence is the equality order is strong, partial orders do not induce equivalence classes for like the umpteenth time. Some types have a natural so strong order. Properties of order relations. We can do finer orders. We don't really have time to get into this, but I think everybody understands what a finer order is. Um, we have this really nice reversal property that if less than is an order, so is greater than. As in, in like C++ land, you multiply the result by minus one. And that's an order. It's just the other way. So if you have a strong order, you have at least two. <laughs> Unless your type is trivial. In which case, those two are the same. Um, this is studs, studs strong ordering. This is your favorite type from now on. Uh, uh, you have uh, not enums. They are not enums. They are actually strong order objects in it that are in fact initialized. You can use them uh, that mean the things that you want them to mean. Equal compares with zero as true. Um, and like you have like less than and greater than operators with them. And the idea is that it works like stir CMP. It works like stir CMP. I, like, we've got 18 minutes. Um, the one thing I really want to mention is that a strong ordering is a weak ordering concept, uh, also like inheritance wise. So, um, or rather like it has a conversion operator and stuff. So if it also has to have this equivalent type def, but equivalent is the same as equal. It is the same thing. Um, the intended usage for strong order is that, um, well, if you have a function, it could be named 
operator spaceship, it could be named something like, you know, lexicographical order on my records. It could be named whatever. Um, and it returns one of the, uh, I don't know why I said above types. Um, it, if, if we have a function and it returns strong ordering or weak ordering or partial ordering, we're going to call it an order because it's not a predicate. It returns three possible values. And if it's partial, it returns four possible values. Um, so let's say order is a linear order. If order of x, y equals 0, that's the fancy overloads that we have. Um, uh, well, basically, if it has the same idea of equivalence classes, then it's a strong order. Make it return a strong order. Um, if basically what we're trying to say is that if you return strong ordering from your order, that, it, that means I solemnly swear that the equivalence classes are the same as equals. That's what that means. Please do meta program against this. And if your meta program is literally just specifying the type for what you're assigning this order to so that it'll break when somebody puts a weak order in, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. You should write algorithms that way. If you want to use equals in one place and you actually need to use spaceship in another place because it's faster, just require strong order. Things won't compile if they don't satisfy the axioms of your algorithm. Perfect. Awesome. That's what we want. Um, if it doesn't, return weak ordering. That's basically it. Like, that's how you use these. End of story. Done. Um, examples. Start CMP could, in fact, be returning to the strong ordering. But it's actually good that it's returning an integer because you don't know over what type because char star is not really a type, right? Like it's some representation of something that doesn't really have semantics on top of it. But it could be returning strong ordering over char star strings. Because what we think of char star strings usually have a like bitwise comparison semantics, like usually. Um, but, oh yeah, okay, so we've got uh, a lexicographical order on a uh, complex float. If we disallow nan and infinities, we'll get to those. But that's a strong order, um, semantically. Uh, it's not a natural order because there's like many natural, uh, sorry, many strong orders on complex. Um, can can you find the infinitely many strong orders on complex? Yeah. Yes. That is one way to put it. I was thinking more in terms of um, you. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I think it actually works up to the same thing. But you could compare phase and, yeah, OK. Yeah, OK, OK, OK. OK, good. Um, weak ordering looks approximately the same, but it doesn't have equal. Because it's a weak ordering. It doesn't have equal. It has equivalent. Um, it does the same things. Intended usage, I already said, right? If your ordering is not sure that it has the same equivalence classes as equality, return weak order. Sorry, weak ordering. And then an algorithm will know, oh, I'm not allowed to mix equals and this thing because I can't. Like, they mean different things. Um, for instance, str ICMP is a weak order on nil-terminated strings with stir CMP induced equality. Now there's a funny thing. Stir CMP is a weak order on null terminated case insensitive strings with stir ICMP induced equality. <laughs> so you can have a weak order that's actually stronger than your equality. But because if you like pass a weak order to some algorithm that's not allowed to look at equality because it's a weak order, that's fine. You've just redefined what the type means effectively, right? And that's fine. Yes, Arthur? I don't think that's fine. I mean, I think we talked about this the other day, but that here you've got a weak order which induces equivalence classes, which induce an equivalence. Um, but we already said that natural equality is the strongest possible equivalence, right? 
that's true. I'm basically saying, here's how you use this. Like, yes, if your world actually makes sense, which is not always the case, uh, then equality is the strongest thing you will ever like have. And all weak orders are coarser than the natural one if you have a natural one. Like, they're all coarser than a strong order. Yes, that is true. And then it would no longer be an order. That is true, but it's not less than itself in... Oh, yeah, you're right. Like, a less than copy of A can be true, and that's terrible, so don't do that. Right. Again, because natural ordering, equality, copying, these are all properties of the type, which is the mapping from the species to data. That's true. All right. I, I will almost retract my slide. Um, <laughs> But people will try to do this anyway. The point is, if you have an order that's stronger than your equals, just make it weak. Like, it's not right anyway, but make it weak so that th every algorithm at least knows that it and equals are not the same thing. Okay? Like, at least do that favor to everyone else if you really have to do that. But thank you, Arthur, for the don't do that. All right. Um, partial ordering has also this uh, unordered thing. It's different from all of the other ones. Um, and like in general, because of the way they are used, actually that's a slide, um, they, they don't induce equivalence classes as we've seen, not in general. Um, you are if you're in a partial ordered situation, you are, and you're in an Arthurian world where people do things that make sense, um, <laughs> then uh, you should be able to treat equals equals as a disambiguator between your elements because of the way partial orders are used. Partial orders are used on like graphs of things and like you usually, they're usually very ad hoc. Like, um, and, and so you don't really need the whole, like you, you're basically gonna get unordered or you're gonna get less than or greater than. And then you can test for equality separately. Like that, that's just how algorithms shake out. Like partial orders are different. They're like the, the stepbrother that does weird things with computers on Sundays. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> So um, you can usually make a weak order out of a partial order, and that's called linearization. And has you know, you always yeah, uh, yes, you always can. It's a topological sort. Like that's that's one possibility. But you also could have completely unordered sections, and then topological sort can do weird things because you don't have a single root. And uh, in any case, you always can. But is that the one you want, right? Um, so linearization is actually like a super big uh, field of study because it's used in scheduling theory. It's used in uh, like everywhere, basically. Like you've got ancestor and predecessors in a DAG. That's like a super general formulation of it. Um, you can have teams in a league that did not complete. Those things are unordered. You'd like, and then the final ranking of teams after a tournament is a linearization of that particular uh, partial order, right? Um, and instructions in a basic block in, a, in like static single assignment form, those also like linearizing that is a billion dollar industry. <laughs> Yes, but in the end, you're going to feed it to a core in order. And then the core is going to do this whole thing again. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so the semantics of a uh, spaceship. Uh, it is a three-way comparison operator. Um, and it lets us concisely encode the natural order on the type. If you don't have a natural order, don't provide it. 
Natural orders are all strong. So we have the obvious corollary. Corollary. Um, it's always strong. Um, if you don't follow this advice, you will get into this kind of problems. Obviously, those are all Booleans, so that actually does add up to one all the time. Um, so you will break for unsuspecting code that looks correct if you don't do that. Um, so another thing that I want to mention is a corollary of they induce the same equivalence classes. Equals equals is an optimization of spaceship. As in, if you're comparing two vectors, you can short circuit on size. You can't do that if you're doing spaceship because spaceship is a lexicographical comparison, right? So equals equals is an optimization of spaceship. If you have spaceship, if you don't have spaceship, then equals equals is equals equals. Um, so keep that in mind. It's the same idea as move is an optimization of copy. As far as value types are concerned. If we're talking about mechanisms, things are different, right? Because then don't provide ordering operators. Um, right. So yeah, um, because this should always return a strong order if it exists, like the first thing you do after you call lower bound is compare the w what you got out, right? Like, so first of all, you compare if you even, but well, if you're not at end, right? And then what you do is you dereference that thing and say, wait, uh, did I actually get the element I was looking for or did I get the insertion point? I mean, I got the insertion point at any rate, but like you can then check if it's actually in the set or not. So don't break that kind of code because people do use, you know, spaceshipy things and equals equals in the same context, like let them. Um, this is how this behaves, and there's a scroll bar, so I, I need, oh no, this is the first one. All right, so um, equals equals, you can default it, and that's the really huge thing. If you just want lexicographical comparison in your records, just default spaceship. It will default equality for you. Equality never calls spaceship. There's this whole paper by Barry Revson uh, about how equals equals is not spaceship. We have five minutes left, so I'm not going to say anything about that, but do read it because it's really good reading if you're actually interested in this stuff. Um, there, are, there is like a combinatorial explosion if you don't do that, potentially. So it will in fact default equality for you, and we already saw what defaulting equality does. So please do default spaceship. 95% of the time, that's what you want. The other 5% of the time, this is how you write it. This is how the compiler writes it. And you can just omit one, and then it becomes indiscernible to your type. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's the idea. This is how you write Spaceship, like print this and like have it somewhere. because. Yeah, like the, the, that, that's how you do it. Like there's the, this is the recipe, just do it. It'll work correctly unless you know otherwise then that then you're on your own, right? All right. Um, if you say auto, oh yeah, there's a, there's a thing that I forgot to mention. Do say strong ordering over there. Don't say auto. Don't say auto because somebody is going to come along that hasn't seen this talk and is going to change one of your members' operator spaceship to weak order, and then your code's not going to break. It's just going to si silently start returning weak order. Because we've got, you know, like, if people do weird things, we try to help them not completely shoot themselves in the foot, right? And so we've got this stud common comparison category and, like, common type and all that kind of stuff that should never be used with ordering. Um, but we do do that, and if you put stud strong ordering there, the compiler generated thing is going to try to convert a weak order to a strong ordering, and it will fail at compile time. And then you're going to be able to say to that person, you should watch this talk and never do this again. <laughs> um, so uh, the cool thing is the relational operators rewrite to spaceship. 
you only get one function that is then hot code. You don't get 1,500 functions all over the place. Um, so they rewrite to spaceship both ways. So if one of your types defines a dot operator spaceship, which is how you should define it because we made it symmetric. There's no longer this caveat of if you have a free function, things are going to be nice and symmetric. Just define it as a member, and then you don't have to do ADL, and you still get the symmetry. Because we're going to make an overload set of both like, this way and this way, and then we're going like, to do the whole disambiguation rig rigmarole, and then you end up with one function that you're actually calling, and that's what happens. Uh, and yes, it is possible you're going to get into ambiguities. You should remove them. Uh, because if you get into ambiguities, that means that there, is, there are types that know about each other both ways. And that is most commonly a layering violation. Um, yeah, so we do order switching for you and all that stuff. Uh, when should I actually call spaceship by name? Um, in stuff like find in a map, right? Instead of comparing twice, you get to call the comparator once, and then you get to have a three-way switch statement. That's only if it implements that, uh, the, the, the spaceship operator? That is usually the only reason you need to call spaceship. No, I, and that would work only if that type implemented the spaceship? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, if you want something else, then there is something else, and I'll call it. Okay, so don't actually call spaceship unless you really know you have to call spaceship. I've got one minute left and I really want to get to floating point. So, um, uh, promise that. All right, all right, all right. This is all okay. Floating point. Um, right. Oh yeah, I, I should probably say this. There are three customization points that you really need to know about. If your type does not have a natural order, but you still want to provide a default order, such as a le lexicographical comparison on, on uh, complex, because you want to put it in maps, then you overload strong order. That's your customization point. Notice that it's an inline friend. We have a CPO, uh, customization point object, in stud that's going to find by ADL your customization point in your class and call it. So if you need a strong order and you don't care which one it is, just call stud strong order x, y, you're good. It will pick up spaceship, it'll pick up your customization points, it will pick up just about anything that promises the right axiom. Uh, we also have a weak order which should dispatch to weak order for floats, but otherwise will actually just call strong order. If you don't have a specific specialization, you can also provide partial order, though I have no idea why you'd want to do that. Uh, it will also just dispatch to weak order, which will dispatch to strong and preferentially to spaceship and blah, blah, blah. You don't care about all those rules. The, the rules make sense. Just define your strong order if you don't have a spaceship that is strong. That will allow people to put your type in maps. Um, so the cool thing, though, if you'll permit me two minutes. Um, thanks to Lawrence Crowell, we finally have the floating point intrinsics for orders in the language. You don't have to do assembly anymore if you used to do assembly for comparing floats. There's Two orders, well, actually, there's three orders that the IEC 559 standard defines. The strong order for floats and doubles and long doubles will get you almost a bitwise comparison that is consistent with less than on normal floats for normal floats, but basically all NANDs are different. However, they're equal to themselves. Like, basically, the payload has to be the same. So if you compare a NAND to itself, it'll be true. Uh, and they're actually ordered like, then there's a weak order on floats, which is probably what you want, in which case all NANDs compare equal because you do modulo payload. Uh, infinities compare equal and stuff like that. Like that's pr probably what you want if you want to put floats in the map. Don't forget the signed zeros. 
zeros. Oh yeah, the signed zeros. Yes, the the strong order distinguishes between signed zeros. The weak order doesn't. So if you're putting floats in a map, use the stud stud weak order algorithm and use that, and it'll work just peachy. Um, and then the the partial order is actually the one that we get with operator less than on floats. Um, and you don't want to use that, so just like don't. Um, We've, I've got a few bu a bunch of examples like there's the these like stud is LT is GT is GTLQ and stuff like that. If you really want to test what you know the result of spaceship came out of, just use the less than. Just use less than. You very rarely have to use that because you very rarely have to call spaceship by name in any case. But there are things like that. And that's, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Have fun and optimize. <laughs> <laughs>